Have you ever clicked sign in with Google and instantly access an app, no password required? That smooth experience is thanks to something called single sign-on, and it's everywhere, from your workplace apps to your favorite streaming services. But there's more going on behind the scenes than just convenience. In this video, we'll cover how SSO and Federation work, what protocols like SAML, OAuth, and OpenID Connect are actually doing, and how to keep your identity provider secure. Let's get into it. Single sign-on, or SSO, lets you log in once and access multiple systems without having to log in again for each one. Let's say you sign into your company's intranet in the morning. From there, you can access your email, HR portal, file storage, and third-party tools like Slack or Teams, all without having to type in your username and password over and over. That's single sign-on at work. The idea is simple. You authenticate once with a central system, usually called your identity provider or IDP, and that system vouches for you when you try to access other services. Those services are called service providers. Instead of maintaining separate logins for every application, the service providers trust the identity provider to handle the authentication. That means fewer passwords to remember, fewer logins to manage, and fewer chances for someone to mess up and reuse the same weak passwords everywhere. But it's not just about convenience. Single sign-on makes life easier for IT teams. It centralizes authentication, which means you can control access from one place. If someone leaves the company, you don't have to disable 12 different accounts, just one. Now this introduces a new challenge. If that one account gets compromised, an attack can gain access to everything the user had. That's why SSO should always be combined with strong authentication controls like multi-factor authentication, session timeouts, and monitoring for unusual activity. In short, SSO simplifies the login process, improves user experience, and helps centralize control. But it needs to be implemented securely to avoid becoming a single point of failure. Now that we understand how SSO works in a single organization, let's talk about how it extends across company boundaries. And that's where Federation comes in. Federation is all about about trust between organizations or systems. It allows users to log into an external service using credentials from their primary identity system, even if the system is owned by a different company. Here's a simple analogy. Imagine you're visiting a secured building, but instead of applying for a new badge, you show your government issued ID or driver's license, and the receptionist lets you in because they trust the authority that issued it. That's what Federation does. The service provider trusts your identity provider. Let's look at a real world example. You try to log into a third party application like Salesforce. But instead of creating a new Salesforce account, you're redirected to your company's Microsoft login page. Once you authenticate there, Microsoft confirms who you are and Salesforce lets you in. You never had to create a separate username or password for Salesforce. Behind the scenes, a federation trust is in place between your company, the identity provider, and the third party application, the service provider. That trust is often set up using standards like SAML or OpenID Connect, which we'll touch on shortly. Federation is what makes cross domain SSO possible. Within your own environment, SSO SSO might let you move between internal apps without logging in again, but Federation extends that same convenience and control to external systems without needing to duplicate user accounts or passwords. In summary, Federation allows users to access systems outside their own organization using a trusted identity. It's the backbone of cloud-based access, partner integrations, and just about any SSO setup that crosses company lines. So how exactly does SSO and Federation work together? Think about it like this. SSO is the experience, logging in once and gaining access to multiple systems without having to authenticate to each of them. And Federation is the mechanism that makes that experience possible across different systems or organizations. Let's walk through another example. You open up a new app, maybe Spotify, Trello, or Zoom, and you see the option sign in with Google. When you click it, the app redirects you to a Google login page. Now, if you're already logged into your Google account, you don't have to enter your password again. Google confirms your identity and sends a secure message, often called a token, back to the app, which essentially says, yes, this this is the user. Now the app trusts Google and Google's vouching for you, so they let you in. That's single sign-on in action. You logged into Google once and now you're using that identity to access other services. And that trust between Google and the other app, that's federation. So even though Spotify, Zoom, and Trello aren't part of Google, they trust Google to handle the authentication. And that's the power of a federated SSO setup. It creates a smooth login experience while keeping identities centralized and secure. And this helps reduce password fatigue, simplifies account management, and cuts down on risky behaviors like reusing passwords across sites. Now that you know how SSO and Federation work together, let's pull back the curtain and take a look at the protocols that make it all possible. There's a few key ones that you'll hear about in the identity and access management world. First, let's talk about the Security Assertion Markup Language, or SAML. SAML is one of the oldest and most widely used protocols for federated SSO, especially in enterprise environments. 
It works by sending a special message called an assertion from the identity provider to the service provider. That assertion says, this person is authenticated. It also contains some basic user information. You often see SAML use with apps like Salesforce, Workday, or older corporate systems. It's XML based, which means it uses a structured text format. It's not something you usually see, but it works really well for backend systems. And while it's not the newest thing on the block, it's still a very solid choice for enterprise single sign-on. Next, we have OAuth 2.0. This isn't really for logging you in, it's designed to let apps request access to certain parts of your account, like your calendar, without needing your password. For example, when you let a calendar app read your Google Calendar, that's OAuth in action. Finally, we have OpenID Connect, and this is where it gets more modern. OpenID Connect builds on top of OAuth 2.0 and adds authentication on top of authorization. Think of OAuth 2.0 like giving someone a guest pass. They can access one part of your account, like your calendar, but they don't get the keys to everything. But what if the service also needs to know who you are. OpenID Connect adds a digital version of your ID card, something that proves your identity to the app. It's like providing a key and showing your photo ID to prove that you're the one that's supposed to have it. When you use the sign in with Google or Microsoft buttons to log into accounts such as Dropbox, Zoom, or Spotify, you're using OpenID Connect behind the scenes. It's lightweight, JSON based to make formatting easy for humans to read and machines to parse, and it's widely used for both web apps and mobile applications. Now you don't need to memorize every detail, but if you key things to remember are, SIML powers a lot of enterprise SSO. OAuth 2.0 handles access permissions, but not authentication itself. And OpenID Connect is the go-to for modern login experience. These protocols are what let different systems speak the same language when it comes to identity. And they're what makes SSO and Federation work smoothly behind the scenes. SSO and Federation offer a ton of convenience, but like most things in cybersecurity, the more convenient you make things to use, the less secure you're inherently making them. Here's a few security trade-offs you need to be aware of. First, we have single point of failure. When you centralize all of your authentication through a single identity provider, that system becomes a high value target. If an attacker compromises your SSO account, they can potentially access everything tied to it. Email, stored files, HR systems, cloud apps, everything. That's why it's critical to harden your identity provider. This includes using things like multi-factor authentication or MFA. Without MFA, SSO becomes a much riskier setup because a single stolen password could unlock everything. If a password gets fished or leaked, MFA could still potentially stop the attacker from getting access to your account. For organizations using SSO, enabling MFA at the identity provider level is non-negotiable. We also want to make sure we have logging and monitoring enabled. Since all logins are funneled through one place, the good news is you only need to monitor one system for suspicious activity. Bad news is, if you're not watching closely, a breach could go unnoticed. Set up alerts for unusual login patterns, including logins from unfamiliar countries, after hours access, and failed MFA attempts. These could all potentially point to compromised accounts. Session management is another good control to protect our identity provider. Because SSO can keep you logged in across many apps, sessions can last a long time. That's convenient, but risky. We want to implement policies like session timeouts, forced re-authentication after inactivity, and blocking logins from risky devices or locations. Finally, we want to make sure we have the ability to do something called single logout. This one's often overlooked. If you log out of one app, but your session stays active in another, you might think you've signed out when really you haven't. Single logout helps ensure that logging out of your identity provider ends your session across all connected services. SSO and Federation can make authentication both easier and more secure, but only if your identity provider is properly protected. With right protocols and strong security practices in place, these tools become the foundation of modern access control. You should treat your identity provider like the key to your castle and guard it accordingly. And if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing to the channel or check out one of the other videos on screen. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.